about the time I think I've been through enough, he'll come another enough. And you'll have to go through it all again. I was reading one day, and I'm trying to think of where it's at, and I can't remember, uh, but it's in one of the minor prophets. It's talking about our tri trials and our troubles, and it, sa it says, if need be, and I got hung up on them need be's. You ever been stung by a need be? I have. And about the time you think you'll get over one of them need be's, he'll come another need be and sting you all over again. I guess I come up with some crazy things. What I'm going to say, what I started to say, I'm going to save till next Sunday. I want to speak to you tonight from the book of Revelation again. Uh, I love this book. Uh, I love to study prophecy. And uh, I, I wish I knew the book of Revelation like I want to know it. I've never been anybody, never met anybody that knows it like they want to know it, knows it all. But I've sat under some great preachers that's uh, preached some great messages from the book of Revelation. But there's enough in the book of Revelation to keep me going back to it time and time again. I may not understand all of it, but I sure do believe all of it, every word of it. But in studying the book of Revelation, I found there are a word, there is a word that's mentioned four times in the book of Revelation. And it's the word door or doors. They're mentioned four times. But in two of those times, it's talking about the same door. So I want to speak to you tonight on the three doors of Revelation. Turn with me, if you would, please, to chapter 3, the book of Revelation. I said this morning that when you're studying the book of Revelation, it's divided into three divisions. Chapter 1 is the first division. The second division is chapter 2 and 3. And the third division covers chapter 4 through chapter 22. Things which are, the things which shall be, and the things uh, that are seen. Well, Revelation chapter 1 and verse, where is it at? 19. The things which thou hast seen, that's chapter 1. The things which are chapter 2 and 3. And that's where we're at tonight. The things which shall be hereafter, chapter 4 and following. So I want us to look tonight in the second division, the book of Revelation. Now, this is concerning the seven churches of Asia Minor. There are some that believe that each one of these churches represents a stage that the church goes through or an age that the church goes through. Now, I'm not sure whether that's true or not, but I do know that we're in the last church age. We're in what is known as the Laodicean church age. Neither cold nor hot. And their philosophy is that we have need of nothing. Churches today are enjoying things that they have never enjoyed in the history of the church. And we think that we have arrived. That's a sign that we're in the last church age. For Jesus says, you think that you have everything but you're poor and blind and naked. Now God's eyes is seeing something that man don't see in the last church age. However, 
There are things in all seven churches that's mentioned in chapter 2 and 3 that we can glean from and that will help us. Tonight I want you to look at verse 7 in chapter 3 concerning the church of Philadelphia. Now, you know, and it hasn't changed, you've even noticed it on the news, uh, when our presidential candidates go to that city, they always call it the city of brotherly love. I spent some time in the city of Philadelphia years ago, uh, several months. I didn't find it to be a friendly city. Now maybe I was looking in the wrong direction, but I didn't see much friendliness in that city. But anyhow, that's what the word Philadelphia means. And the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth and no man shutteth and shutteth, no man openeth. I know thy works. He says that to every single one of the churches. And my friend, the Lord does know. He knows everything there is to know about the church. He knows why people attend the church. He knows what they're doing when they're at church. Everybody that's at church don't worship. Did you know that? They're doing a lot of other things uh, rather than worshiping. The Lord knows all of that. Now, he said, I know thy works. In verse 8, behold, I have set before thee, here's the first one, an open door, and no man can shut it. For thou hast a little strength, and hast kept my word, and hast not denied my name. Behold, I will make them of the synagogue of Satan, which say they are Jews and are not, but do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before thy feet, and to know that I have loved thee. Because thou hast kept the word of my patience, I will also keep thee from the hour of temptation, and thank God for that which shall come upon all the world to try them that dwell upon the earth. Behold, I come quickly. Hold that fast which thou hast, that no man take thy crown. Him that overcometh will I make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he shall go no more out. And I will write upon him the name of my God, and the name of the city of my God, which is New Jerusalem, which cometh down out of heaven from my God. Now will write upon him my new name. He that hath an ear, let him hear what the Spirit saith unto the churches. Now I know, and you know, that we preach a whole lot and believe that Jesus is coming quickly. He tells that in verse 11. Every time you mention or the Bible mentions Jesus coming, it's always in a quick kind of sense. He's not going to take his time when he gets ready to come. When God says, son, go get your church, it's going to be over like that. Jesus is coming quickly. And we preach that and we believe that. That means that if he's at the door, then why should I work any harder in the church? Why should I do anything to try to get folks to come to the knowledge of the Lord Jesus? Why should I invite anybody to come to church if he's at the door? Well, Jesus tells us in verse 8 that he has set before us an open door. Now that door means that the opportunity for the church to do a great work is not over. 
The door's still open. The opportunities are still there. There's still time for your family and my family to get saved. There's still time for our neighbors to come to know Christ. The Lord has set before us an open door. And I don't believe there's any limits to us when we step beyond that door. Our problem is getting through the door. Doesn't make any difference how wide open it is. It's no good unless we go through it. Amen. Now there are some doors that are shut to keep you out. But this is not one of them. This is a door that God said to the Philadelphia church, I'm going to open this door and no man's going to shut it. Your opportunities to do what I want you to do is not over. Listen to what he says to that church. Thou hast a little strength. He didn't tell them they were great and strong. But they got a little strength. I think that just about describes Chesney Free Will Baptist Church. Amen. We got a little strength left, but thank God we're not an invalid. Amen. We're not walking with a limp yet. We're not in a wheelchair yet. The door is still open if we'll use our strength for the Lord Jesus Christ. God's never asked you and God's never asked me to do a single solitary thing that he didn't know that I was capable of doing. Amen. And he promised me that if I would step out on his promise, he'd give me the strength to carry it out. He set before us an open door, folks. I believe that if we walk through that door, the best days for our church is down the road rather than behind us. We get so easily discouraged. I don't know where it bothers you or not, but it bothers me when folks join our church and then cease to attend. Amen, it bothers me. It bothers me when folks leave our church and go to another church. And I don't care if the other church is a good church, it still bothers me. I'm just being as honest as I know how to be. I think that I would stack our church up against any church in the country as far as getting what we need to live the Christian life. We've got good singing Amen right there. We got a good choir. Got the best preacher in the country. Don't say amen. I'm kidding. I'm by far not that. But we've got what we need. But the door is still wide open for us. And there's so much beyond the door that you and I haven't seen. Amen. When folks leave our church, we need to get more in to take their place. Right? If not, these pews are going to be empty like they are tonight. Right? There ought to be as many on Sunday night as they were on Sunday morning and maybe even more. Amen. This is the crowd that ought to be here on Wednesday night. And you could be if you put forth a little extra effort and walk through that door that God's opened for you. Amen. Aren't you glad you come tonight? Aren't you glad you're here? God knows exactly what we need. We not only have a little strength, but he goes on to say in verse 8, you've kept my word and hast not denied my name. That's never been done here at our church. And I pray that it never will be done in our church. If any man ever mounts this pulpit and denies the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, if I'm here, I'll stand up and say, fella, shut up. Amen. 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 
But as far as I know, we'll never have that done. But I just thought I'd let you know that in case it did happen. Jesus said, because, verse 10, because you've kept the word of my patience, I'll keep thee from the hour of temptation. Aren't you glad of that? Which shall come up on all the world and try them that'll dwell upon the earth. So God set before us an open door of opportunity like he did the church at Philadelphia. Chapter 3 and verse 20. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, there it is twice, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. I wish I hadn't said what I did in the beginning because I'd sure like to say it again right here. This is the Laodicean church, the last church age that this world will ever know. This church age begin in Acts chapter 2. This church age will end when Jesus comes again. And the day of grace is going to be over. We are under the grace of God and I'm so glad that we are. This is a church that Jesus says neither hot nor cold. It's a church that Jesus makes sick at his stomach because he said I'll spew thee out of my mouth. You do that when you get sick at your stomach, don't you? And Jesus said, I'd rather you be cold than to be lukewarm, but I'd rather for you to be hot than to be lukewarm. But the church as a whole in this day and time is a lukewarm church. We are so engulfed in trying to be politically correct that we offend the Lord Jesus Christ and we offend his word. It's not politically correct this day and time to single out gays and lesbians. I don't have to single them out. The Bible's already done it. And all I have to do is to repeat what God said, whether that be politically correct or not. Amen. Amen. The Bible's to be politically correct. You can't call people drunkards anymore. You have to say they're addicted to alcohol, which is a disease. No, the Bible says they're drunkards. And if the Bible says it, all I got to do is repeat it. No, Jesus wouldn't be politically correct in this world. And he wasn't politically correct when he was alive. How did I get on that? But I'm sure glad I did. But that's where the church is at this day and time. Jerry and I was talking the other day. Now listen to me. Listen to what I'm saying. I don't believe that a suit and a tie makes a preacher a preacher. Businessmen wear suits and ties. My doctor, well, he used to. Now he's a slouch, but he used to wear suit and tie. Amen. But you think my doctor's a slouch? Look at some of them preachers on TV. You know why they're dressing like that? They're dressing like that so that they, they this is what they say, that they'll not feel above the congregation but they'll feel like one of them. I passed a church rather well pretty good sized church on my way to church and on my way back home. Last Sunday morning I saw three men in the parking lot Bibles under their arm and wearing shorts end of the church. Now I wonder when the pastor's going to put his on and climb in the pulpit with his shorts on. He wants to feel like one of them. The next step for that church, you're going to see women in bikinis. 
That might be a good church to pastor. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I hope y'all know I'm kidding. But we're living in a day and time when churches are neither hot nor cold, but they're trying to please everybody that comes along and they're forgetting their greatest opportunity and the greatest obligation is not to please the people, but to please God. Amen. He's the builder of the church. He owns the church. And he's coming back for the church. Now, Revelation 3.20. Now listen to me, listen to me close. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come in to him and will sup with him and he with me. That is an individual that he's talking to there. It's not a church. If Jesus is the Lord of a New Testament church, he's already on the inside, not on the outside trying to get in. You follow what I'm saying? Revelation chapter 1, they sang that song a little bit ago about Jesus being in the midst. Look at verse 13 in Revelation 1. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot and girt about the paps with a golden girdle. His head and his hairs were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were as a flame of fire, and his feet like unto fine brass if they burned in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. He had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in his strength. That's the Lord Jesus Christ, and where is he at? He's in the midst of his church. Amen. So this is an individual that the Lord is speaking to in verse 20. And if that individual, when God knocks on his heart's door, opens the door, Jesus will come in. I'm glad I opened the door years ago. I'm glad I said, Jesus, I don't want you on the outside, I want you on the inside. And thank God, he came in. A couple of things about knocking at the door. <coughs> Number one, Jesus had the power to push the door open if he wanted to, but he's not going to come in unless he's invited in. You hear that? He made the door. He has a right to go in anytime he wants to, but he's not going to come into an individual's heart unless that individual opens the door and invites him in. Number two, thank God he's still at the door today for those that are not saved and he's still knocking. How does he knock, preacher? No. He knocks through the Holy Spirit dealing with a person's heart. When they hear a song or they hear a testimony or they hear a message, whether it be on radio or in church or any place else, the Holy Spirit knocks on their door. That's Jesus standing at the door knocking, asking them, please open the door. Amen. There are many ways that the Lord convicts. But let me go on. Revelation chapter 4, third door, verse 1. After this I look. And behold, a door was opened in heaven. The first voice which I heard was as it were of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. Immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was set, up, set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. Guess who that is? 
And he that sat was to look upon like a jasper and a sword and stone. There was a rainbow round about the throne, in sight like unto an emerald. And around about the throne were four and twenty seats. And upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting. Now those four and twenty elders are representative of the child of God that's been called from this old earth into heaven. That's representative of you and I when Jesus comes again. They're clothed in verse 4 in white raiment. They had on their heads crowns of gold. Out of the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices. And there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. I wish I had time to read it all. But down in verse 10, <coughs> the four... <coughs> The four and twenty elders fall down before him that sat on the throne and worship him that liveth forever and ever. And watch this. And cast their crowns before the throne. If we get a crown, we're going to lay it at the feet of Jesus. Why, preacher? Verse 11. Thou art worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power, for thou hast created all things, and for thy pleasure they are and were created. They rightfully belong to him if we are faithful enough to receive a crown. Amen. There's five crowns in the Bible that a Christian can win, and I don't have time to get into all of those. But if you should or I should, when we get to heaven, we know where we're going to put them. At the feet of the Lord Jesus. Revelation chapter 4 is a picture of the rapture of the church. It's a picture of God calling us out of here and calling us into heaven. A couple of things that I noticed about this. Verse 3, there's a rainbow round about the throne. I have never and you have never saw a complete rainbow. We only see half of one that stretches from here to yonder. Oh, by the way, have you ever found out there's no pot of gold at the end of the rainbow? <laughs> Them little old green monsters lied to us, didn't they? leprechauns. We've only saw a half a rainbow. A partial of a rainbow. There is such a thing that's called an inverted rainbow when you see a double rainbow in the clouds but the second rainbow colors is reversed from the first rainbow. I don't know if you've ever noticed that or not. One of the astronauts that went into space years ago said that he looked out the window of the vessel that he was in and saw a complete rainbow circling the earth. Him and another fellow on board is the only two people that I know of that's ever seen a complete rainbow. But by the grace of God, one of these days I'm going to see a complete rainbow and it's going to be completely around the throne of God, which is in heaven. That rainbow was made by God. Did you know that? Go back to the book of Genesis. God put a rainbow in the clouds to let Noah know that there be no more destruction of the world by water. No more the judgment of God by water. Now, I don't know where that still carries true in the time when we'll get to heaven and Jesus sits on the throne and we'll see the rainbow round about the throne but I know this all of God's judgments are gone and we'll not ever see them again because we're in heaven amen read this when you get home it'll bless your heart to see that Jesus is sitting there in all of his glory 
in all of his splendor. In Revelation chapter 4. Let's stand together, please. 